Kia ora. welcome to the first series of Stuff That Matters Now, a podcast brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I'm Harv, a.k.a. Ian Harvey, founder of Collective Intelligence, and it's going to be my great pleasure in this series to introduce to you a bunch of really cool people who are making a difference in the world every single day. Our job here at Collective Intelligence is to help curious people evolve and become more courageous so they can tackle the stuff that's needed to make this world a better place. Before we crack on and talk about the stuff today's guest had to share with us, a big shout out to Rob McDonald and his talented team at, at Tiwonga at State over there in Hawke's Bay. Not only do these guys make international gold medal winning wines, they've helped us bring this podcast to your ears. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Rod. Okay, welcome back, everybody, to Stuff That Matters Now. I'm downtown Auckland here uh, with Rod Oram. Good morning, Rod. Atamarie, Ian. Atamarie, I am very excited to have this interview this morning. This is going to be hopefully an annual interview. Uh, depending on how this goes. If you're boring, Rod, then this is the last one, okay? So we'll, we'll make this the January joust. The, yes, yes, but you've got to be good, okay? But no pressure. Uh, All right. no, I'm very relaxed. <laughs> I, I'm better when I'm relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, this interview is uh, I'm really excited about because Rod has got this phenomenal uh, background and worldview uh, coming from many years as a journalist. I'm going to get Rod to qualify himself soon, so you get a feel for just how experienced the guy is. Uh, we've got a schedule today, first time ever uh, in this podcast, and uh, this is going to be looking at predominantly where the world is right now, then looking at how New Zealand fits into that world, which is in a fascinating space. Uh, I'm really interested in how to get accurate information uh, in this day and age of social media and fake news and all sorts of shit and Murdoch Empire and all that goes with it. And then Rod's interested in giving us a view of what he's going to work on for the next five years. So that's, that's, that's Rod's little piece that he's added into the conversation and... Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's the schedule for today. Um, and Rod is not a member, so Rod, you're the first non-member I have interviewed, uh, and I forgive you for that. Well, no, thank you for the, uh, <laughs> the honour and the opportunity. <laughs> um, so Rod, can you just frame up quickly, and I'm really mindful of time because mm. we've got a lot to get through today, mm. but could you just frame up where the hell you've come from uh, to be in this position that you are today? Um, I'll start with describing myself as a generalist. So um, I know a little bit about a wide range of things. My knowledge is quite horizontal in that case. Um, whereas so many people in the world, their knowledge is very vertical because things are very complicated, so they become deep experts, but in a, a narrow slice of knowledge. So what I enjoy hugely, whether it's um, in my work or um, uh, in my sort of social life, or, and the two tend to blur between, between them, um, I love to be the person in the room who knows the least on a specific issue. Um, but um, So I learn from the people who know a lot. But what I hope I bring to the conversation is but because I range very far and wide as a generalist, I'm able to bring some different perspectives into the conversation. So I, I'm trying to bring a sort of a horizontal um, linkage to these verticals, and those are always wonderful conversations. And um, I do that as a journalist, um, but that's so deeply ingrained after all these years that, again, it's perhaps quite hard to differentiate between me as a journalist and, and me as just me. Rod, have you always been a, a generalist? Were you, were yes. you? Yes. I, I was one of these really annoying kids. I think it's probably typical of being lower down in the family. I was number three. Um, of just always the little cheeky chap who was always saying, well, what about this and why that? And uh, I had very patient parents, less patient older brother, reasonably patient older sister, uh, who indulged me in that. And I have very vivid memories of my father doing things like taking me out into the drive, not to give me a 
belting, uh, but to sort of guddle around underneath the car and you see what well, you see, there's the engine there and right. the, you know, there's this gearbox and then there's the drive shaft and there's the rear differential which helps the car get round corners. So that's kind of um, just how I've always been. And in essence, as a journalist, I'm just doing something incredibly selfish. I'm just trying to make some sense of what I see out there in the world so I don't go crazy. No, I mean literally. And so... Uh, if I can then be helpful to other people by putting this out there in various ways, in what I write, what I say, um, or what I say in presentations, then I'm happy about that. Uh, I feel as I've then been useful. So how do you know what to focus on? I think there's two drivers. Uh, there is um, sort of an external push, if you like, um, issues that come very starkly to the fore, um, or it can be quite subtle. I can be talking to somebody and they will make a particular point about something, or it might not even be that obvious, but it's an external thing. You go, Gosh, that's really interesting. I, I wonder what that means. I, I need to find out about that. But then the other side is um, it's deeply internal. It's, um, you know, the gut is an amazing thing. And I, I just sort of think to myself, that just actually doesn't sound right or feel right. I, I want to have a look at that. I, I want to understand that. So that's essentially the kind of the push and the pull um, that helps me sort out how I'm going to spend my time. As I address, I had a conversation the other day uh, around intuition and how important intuition is. And we were talking about leadership and the subtlety of leadership and how experience helps our intuition because we've got a, you know, a whole lot of body of information to, to draw on. Uh, and I, I've often wondered, how do we teach kids about intuition? How, to, how do they know what intuition is and what does it feel like? Sorry, sounds, this is tautological. Intuition is intuitive, it's inherent. However, we um, put an awful lot of things in its way. So uh, our brains are overactive, we overanalyze, uh, we get very emotional, and we uh, you know, beat up on ourselves or, or create sort of. Gosh, I've never done that, Rod. Wonky narratives, <laughs> you, know, you name it. And, and so we suppress that um, intuition. A person who's been helpful to me in uh, recent years on this is um, a coach called Greg Menendez uh, here in New Zealand um, who uh, runs wonderful programs um, on that. And it, it's about um, being able to let that um, intuition, those insights, flow. And um, so that's a very important part of the process for me. But, of course, once you have an intuition, um, and this is where Greg and I would disagree a little or we have some spirited discussions about um, he would argue that that intuition uh, is very strong very real and and I, I go yes but I still want to check it out I, yeah. I, I still want to test it um, you know th seek some evidence look at it every which way um, so it's again it's the journalist in me that can't quite let go <laughs> and, and verify because I mean you cannot right about intuition, right? You've actually got to have some, some facts and figures and so forth to back it up. Yes, and from a, um, a um, I was going to say a cowardly point of view, but from a rational point of view, um, it, it's no help to me if I put things out there which are patently nonsense um, and, um, you know, people rightly land on me from a great height and point out yeah. how foolish I've been. So, um, in a sense, that's a caution. Um, you know, I, I'm, you, it's not that I lack courage. I mean, I'm perfectly willing to say, you know, bold things, uh, controversial things that uh, I feel have some real sense to me and maybe value to others. Um, but I always want to, to do that check um, to really wrestle with something, to make sure of uh, some integrity to it. Okay. So, Rod, just quickly give us a, a, a bit of a history of where you've come from. You, you've obviously got an English accent, um, and, and, and that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll come back to that point. <laughs> so, so can just give, give the listeners a background of where you've come from. For those who don't know you, uh, in a few minutes, just... Give us a view of, of your professional career till now so we can get some context. 
I'll make this chronological because, um, you know, life is a journey. It does unfold. And, and in a sense, each of the phases, um, whilst there's sometimes pauses, dis- discontinuities between them, there is, a, I think, a, a flow to this. I was born in, in Birmingham in England um, at the time, uh, one of the great industrial cities of the world. Um, in fact, it called itself the workshop of the world. My first bike was... It was a BSA. Well, BSA stood for Birmingham Small yep, Arms. Yep. So they made pistols and such things as besides bikes. And um, so I grew up there um, in the 1950s and 1960s. And um, my father wasn't in industry. Interestingly, he worked in the wholesale fruit and vegetable market. So he was very connected with his growers out in the country. And, and I think it's really quite... Uh, and I'll come back to that urban-rural connection here in New Zealand where we talk about current things because, again, that's very formative for me. And, um, of course, it was a, a time when um, Birmingham was still very successful but carried to at least two costs with it. The first was uh, terrific local air pollution. Um, coal was used to generate electricity, to make gas, um, to uh, power steam engines and in other, other industrial processes. And so in the middle of winter, we often had terrible smogs and it was dark in the middle of the afternoon and we all had terrible catarrh and sinus trouble and all the rest. The other thing was that post-Second World War, um, to fill low-paid jobs, there was a huge influx of um, immigration, um, particularly from the Caribbean and the Indian subcontinent. So um, I saw those racial tensions start to develop in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. I've got to be careful here because um, I was young at the time and I always have to try and sort out in my mind how much of that is I've understood in hindsight and I certainly wouldn't claim Mm. that um, as a sort of 10, 12, 15-year-old I, you know, had a heightened sensitivity to to those issues. But anyway, um, I um, went to school. I was generally happy at school, had a last bad year there and did terribly in my A-level exams and... Um, seriously badly. (laughs) However, the ace in the hole for me was I had won an exchange scholarship to the States, um, a high school exchange program, English speaking union. So um, reluctantly, because my father wanted me to stay back and do my A-levels again, but my sister and uh, a wonderful woman who had become my mother in many respects after my mother died when I was young, uh, Kate, Sister Kate and, and Leslie, uh, persuaded my father to let me go anyway, so I did go and went to Colorado and went to an, an amazing, uh, quite unusual school, wonderful school, Colorado Academy outside Denver. And you were what age? Uh, I was 18 at the time. Yep. And that was amazing because it sort of kind of picked me up and pointed me in the right direction. And I um, decided I wanted to stay for university, which was a bit of a quixotic idea because it was very expensive and you know I could get no family support my father at this point had a second bunch of children and and um, um, no money to spare on me but anyway the headmaster of the school Chuck Froelicher was very helpful I got into a very good university Northwestern in Chicago and um, they gave me a place but no money but they, he interceded and they came up with a scholarship and loans and a student job and um, so I was able to be self-supporting as an undergraduate and then a graduate student in, in Chicago and uh, Chuck remained a lifelong friend and he died in his mid-90s only sort of four or five years ago um, so he was a very special person to me and um, so I went to Northwestern University. I carried on with economics there, which I'd started as a, uh, uh, as a teenager in England. Um, but economics started to get very mathematical and, it, and, and too theoretical. And it didn't, I hated the maths. And anyway, this, this optimization of everything didn't make any sense to me. So I br- wonderfully was able to broaden out into the classic American liberal arts education. So I still finished off my economic and politics bit but then I did a whole range of other things which was brilliant for me as the generalist and um, then um, that's where I met um, the wonderful person Lynn who um, we married um, 
a, a year after I finished university, and she had already just finished at that point. And um, but I then crucially stayed to do a master's in journalism because that's during that undergraduate years I decided I want to be a journalist. And there was a very um, particular moment when that happened. It was the summer of 1972. Um, I was spending that summer with the family of one of my roommates. Um, Patrick Goldstein in Miami and I was working on a job on a construction site Um, but in the evenings I was hanging out with Patrick who was a TV intern for one of the local stations at the Democrat and Republican um, presidential nomination conventions which were both on Miami Beach that summer Um, Nixon and McGovern being the respective um, candidates chosen and uh, of course it was um, just after Watergate, although we didn't know the implications of Watergate at that time. And uh, it was just wonderful hanging out with journalists. And that's when I decided, what is this completely brilliant job? I get paid to just kind of find out about stuff. And I thought, well, that's the job for me. But I decided to wait and do that journalism training in graduate school. And Northwestern has a, still does a fabulous journalism school, the Medill School. And that's where I did my master's. And again, somebody was terribly influential. Um, I was working my way through college in Chicago as a taxi driver and working at the weekends for a kosher catering service (laughs) because, um, of course, being very kosher, strictly kosher, they couldn't employ any Jews, so they employed people like me and young blacks from the south side of Chicago. It was wonderful fun. Marvellous bloke, Mayor Stiebel, business. And um, Mayor... Um, knew it was my last year as an undergraduate and late that year he said so Rod what are you going to do afterwards and I said well I'd I'd love to go to Medill but I can't afford it and he said oh okay and um, when I came into work the next weekend he called me into his office and he slid an envelope across the table and it was a check um, for my entire tuition unbelievable and I said well you know I'll pay you back as soon as I I'll start earning money. He said, no, I know you've already got loans as an undergraduate. No, don't worry, just it, it's yours. You don't need to pay me back. There's a whole long more story back there. Yes. And we reconnected just a couple of years ago and because um, we'd lost track of each other. I thought he'd died. It turned out it was his wife who had died when I tried to get in touch with him years ago. Anyway. Was, so, he, was he happy with his investment? He was because he had been a journalist at the Chicago Sun um, before he decided he had enough and wanted to run a kosher catering business. I mean, I've been to more bar mitzvahs and boss mitzvahs than yes. most good Orthodox Jews. And uh, always hugely enjoyed them. Well, I obviously was only there for the catering, not for the ceremony. And anyway, um, he was very happy uh, to hear how my career had uh, progressed. So um, I finished Medill. I was looking for a job. I decided to look in Canada rather than the States, because I was trying to start work with as big a canvas as possible. And um, I was very fortunate to get a job at the Toronto Globe and Mail, a very good national paper with a very strong business section. Um, still, That's still the case today. And so I started there in um, June of 1975. Um, I was in Canada for four years, and then my wife and I decided to move to London. Uh, she wanted to do graduate uh, study in London, I, I thought, well, I might as well do that too. I applied to the London School of Economics. I was rejected and much relieved. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, instead, I got a job at the Financial Times, and um, I started there in 79. This is the London Financial Times. The London job, Financial Times. Which is not a shabby institution. No, no. Um, I took a career step back uh, from the seniority I had in Canada because uh, I was determined to be there. And it took me a few years to dig myself out of that hole at yeah. the but I eventually did. And um, I had a whole series of jobs, um, both editing and writing jobs. Um, so, for example, um, in 1986, I was posted back to New York. I was posted to New York by the FT to be the Wall Street correspondent. So I was there during, for the 87 crash and the af- aftermath and also covering tech companies. For, for the London Times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which was um, an amazing experience. Um, Giuliani, of course, was the um, US attorney for the Southern District of New York, and I went to more than a few press conferences where he was crowing about the latest crims he put away. And there was this Jesuitical fierceness about him, which I sort of uncomfortably admired and I find it completely extraordinary how he's gone completely off the rails since. Anyway, so um, 
wonderful time at the FT. And then out of the blue, uh, where I'm almost up to the New Zealand chapter, in um, October of... 19- just, just, going back yeah. to, just going back to that, because when he became mayor... You know, he was he was just a rock star. Yes. <laughs> Absolute Especially rock star. Especially after 9-11. Absolute rock star, right? Yeah. And you look at him now and you just go, what's happened? Well, you can... Hindsight's always too easy, but um, the, there are characteristics which, in hindsight, were there at the time. And like all of us, we just become caricatures of ourselves as we get older. You know, we are, our good and our bad are... are are um, exaggerated, and if things go really wrong, it's the the, the bad that overwhelms that, um, and and that's that's his case. He um, was always um, a terrific opportunist. Um, it, it was one sensed it was rather more about him than the job. Right. So it was about how great he was about putting these you know white collar criminals right. uh, in jail, um, and. I I use the word uncomfortably because Jesuits have a lot going for them and I I feel badly about attaching this epithet to Giuliani. But um, it's the ability to argue your way out of anything. Um, I I apologise to the Jesuits for that. Um, That was a characteristic. He had a most extraordinary relationship with a succession of wives... Um, which also tell an extraordinarily bad relationship yeah. with a succession of wives, which also, I think, tells me something about him. And what we read about him these days is that he just absolutely craves um, the public attention. Right. Um, so when he, he's desperately unhappy when he's not on television. Right. And so his ability to think that he can talk his way out of anything um, is what we're seeing. But, of course, he's talked Trump into an awful lot of trouble so that's that's the, that's how I see Giuliani over those sort of thirty thirty five years or so. It, look, it's, it's interesting. Gladwell wrote about him once and talking about you know his when he came in as mayor and he he took he took the credit for tidying up the crime yes. in New York, and he said it wasn't anything to do with him uh, at all. It was just a timing thing, and but he took credit for it and was totally unabashed about that. There are amazingly well-proven facts and aspects of this. So, for example, the US, other countries too, switching or getting lead out of petrol um, had a huge impact beneficially on the development of children and on crime rates, lowering crime rates. So um, he wasn't had nothing to do with getting lead out of petrol. (laughs) So... Yeah, I think you have to be extremely careful um, and judicious about what you claim credit for. Right. You know, sorry, I just, yeah, it was, it was I, 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 I just wanted to have a wee dig in, in there. You know, it's uh, well justified. <laughs> okay, so Rod, carry on. With well, so um, October um, 96, I'm at my desk at the FT. I've just been writing about Heineken because I was consumer industries editor at the FT with a running a big writing team. And I got a call from Sheffields, the executive recruiters uh, here in Auckland, and, and asked me if I wanted to hear about a job in New Zealand. And my first response was, well, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm at the FT. I love my job. I, London's a great place to be. But I figured nobody would ever call, call me again about a job, which just turned out to be true so far. And so I said, well... Uh, I found this very flattering. So I said, oh, oh tell me about it anyway. He said, well, at the, by the end of the conversation, I thought, well, actually, this is quite interesting. Um, so I went home to... What was interesting? What was interesting? Um, several facts. Um, first of all, in, 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 I absolutely love the FT to bits. And um, it, it, this weekend was just notable because um, Lionel Barber just retired after 15 years of edit, as editor. And he, um, he and I were both in, New, in the States at the same time in the 80s. He was... Washington bureau chief, and I was Wall Street correspondent in New York. Lionel's been a f- superb editor, and I'm very excited about um, Rula Kalaf, who's taken over as editor. So it, it's not that I, I pine for the FT um, and wished I was still there. Uh, far from it, um, because it's been an amazingly rich 22 years so far here. But the appeal to me was that um, the job on offer was to be business editor at the Herald, and that appealed to me because it took me right back to my Globe and Mail days in Canada. 
because I think business is far, far too important to be um, conf- good journalism, business journalism, to be confined to um, publications like the Financial Times or The Economist. Um, it should be widely read because economics and business at their heart are, like most things in life, are actually conceptually quite simple and we can all get our heads around it. But people in business, people in economics want to make it incredibly complicated uh, and say, well, no, it's it's far too complicated, leave it to us. So the idea um, to come to New Zealand, Tony O'Reilly, the Mm -hmm. Irishman who just bought the Herald from Mm -hmm. the Wilson and Horton families, and um, he was prepared to invest in it to build up the business section, among other parts. So that idea of building um, a good business section in a general paper um, had a huge appeal to me. Cool. That was the first point. The second one was um, I was fascinated by Asia. So I made my first trip to China as a business journalist in January 1979 from Canada. I was on a Canadian trade mission, which was the first trade mission into China just one month after China, um, well, Deng Xiaoping, decided in December um, 78 to open up the country to foreign investment and trade. And whilst New Zealand is still some distance from China, it's not that much further from Beijing yep. as London is. Um, but of course, it, my sense was it was going to be far more more important to New Zealand than it would be to to London. So if I was here, I would have access. Not exactly a ringside seat. Yeah. I, I'm, in, I'm in the upper balcony, sitting at the back. But at least I'm in the same auditorium. And um, um, so that was a, a huge fascination. Um, but then the last thing was, um, and Lynn and I articulated, I think, this quite well to ourselves. We understood that we would be trading in large scale. So in London, we were doing good jobs, big jobs. Um, but we would be gaining dimension. And by that, I mean, uh, as a journalist, even at the FT, I was quite specialised. Um, and, um, you know, every three or four years, you'd move on to another role. Um, but, um, and, and Lynn similarly is an actress and had wonderful roles, but she was quite narrowly typecast. I just realised I'm interviewing the wrong person. She sounds a lot more interesting than you. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, have her on next time. Okay, so can we just wrap this up now? And we'll sure, I'll, I'll give her a call so she can <laughs> come on down. <laughs> and um, so because she's an American, you know, they'd let her do Guys and Dolls at the National Theatre, but Shakespeare, no, 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 darling, you're an American. <laughs> but she can do a terrific English accent. Anyway, so we... Um, and so... Um, most of our friends were journalists and actors who are wonderful friends to have. But we felt that our lives, uh, our work life and the rest of our life wasn't sort of fully integrated. But we felt that coming to New Zealand at a smaller country, we, we'd be working at a much smaller scale, which didn't bother us at all. Uh, but we'd be gaining dimension. And so we theorised that... Um, uh, we would get to know far more people. So I, 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 we've got friends who are farmers and doctors and, you know, you, you name it. I, I, I know you, you know. If I was in, if we were still in London, I would probably have quite a narrow yep. ambit of friends. Yeah, it's quite a different scene. But also, being in a small country, you can have, as a journalist, you can have this, it is a conceit, it's not possible to actually do. But this, um, you can trick yourself some of the time into thinking you can keep kind of a mental model of the whole country going in your head. No, obviously you can't. You don't know everything. But because you know um, a wide variety of people um, and you're in a very wide variety of situations, um, I'm around the country a lot um, having conversations with all kinds of people, um, I, I feel that I understand New Zealand better than I can ever understand the UK. Mm. And I mean, that's even more true in these years Mm. of Brexit, where I I find it quite an alien country, which, um, you know, all the, so many of the negative aspects of that country and that culture have just been massively amplified Mm. and dominate now. Um, Whereas um, in years past, uh, sorry, the, the good stuff is still there. It'll come back. But um, so that was the attraction to us. We'd never been to New Zealand. Um, When Gavin did offer me the job, he suggested we come down for a week. So we came down 
the week leading up to anniversary day in Auckland, actually it's the same as this coming week, um, to see what we thought. And um, we loved it and we came and uh, never regretted it for a moment. Um, Must have been a big shock, though, Rod, coming out of London. <laughs> no, I'll tell you a story. We arrived terribly jet-lagged. Um, I won't dive into how horrible United Airlines was in all that. But um, my first... We arrived on a, um, a Tuesday morning and um, I, Tuesday afternoon, I was having psychometric testing at Sheffield's. And I, I said, ter- we were staying at what was the Sheraton, now the Cordis, of course. And so I said to the taxi driver, look, I've got a bit of time. Just drop me at the waterfront. I, I just really want to see what the waterfront's like. So he dropped me at the bottom of Albert Street and uh, Key Street. And it's kind of like two o'clock on a Tuesday summer afternoon. And there's nobody there. There's nobody there. And, <laughs> and you look to the uh, west and this desolate thing, which was the Viaduct Harbour. And I went, oh, God. <laughs> What year is this? Uh, this was 1997. And I thought, no, no, it's, it's all right. It's just the jet lag. Just relax. So <laughs> I turned up at Sheffield thinking, what's going to turn up on the psychometric testing here? But anyway, it was all fine. I got hired. But then I, that was literally the low point, that first moment. And, of course, um, Auckland, um, Tamaki Makoto, uh, has uh, developed wonderfully over these years. Yes. And... Um, the viaduct harbour, they, they pulled out the old cars and the old tyres and the old shopping trolleys and turned it into something useful and attractive. I, I remember my sister lived in uh, Toronto and New York and she'd been out of the country for seven years and when she came back, she rang me from Auckland and the first words were, where are all the fucking people gone? <laughs> yes. It was just <laughs> classic. Right. She was just like, I went, what? She goes... Was it always like this? I said, I think so. Yeah. You know, and she was just shocked at how few people there were yeah. here after yeah. be, living in that environment. Yes. Yeah. Just to fast forward briefly, because there's so many current things we should be getting onto. Um, I did have a good three and a bit years at the Herald, um, and I thought we achieved um, a lot. But um, it did get frustrating for all kinds of reasons. And um, when Steve Davis took over as editor from Gavin Ellis, who had hired me, um, he and I were on different planets, journalistically and personally. Um, And that resulted in me leaving the... um, Well, I was relieved of my duties and sent home for um, undermining the authority of the editor in front of staff. And I was just going, well, hang on a second, we were just having a discussion about what he wants the business section to be. I mean, isn't that the sort of discussion we're supposed to have? Anyway, um, I I was told to get a lawyer and sent home and relieved of my duties. And um, that was May Day, May the 1st, 2000. And um, I never went back. Um, There was attempts to... Uh, achieve a, a return, but he would never um, agree to uh, to sort out some of the issues between us before we came back. He said, no, no, no just come back and, and we'll look at it. I was going to say you wouldn't really want to go back. Well, well. Um, I did in that um, I was still very committed to the task, yep. um, but it was hard. And um, that first evening on May the 1st, um, Lynn and our daughter Celeste and I, because Celeste was not even 10 at the time, uh, we're sitting around having dinner, and I said, look, I've clearly run out of road at the Herald. So we have to face various things here. Um, I might not go back, so what do we do? You know, Do we want to go back to London? And um, Lynn and Celeste both said, no, 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 we want to stay here. And I said, well, I'm glad you do, because I do too. Right. And I said, I have no idea how this is going to work out. I, I only want to be a journalist. I don't know... There's no other publication I want to work for, so that means I need to be freelance. And I just have no idea what kind of income I can earn. But anyway, things dragged on with the Herald for a long time, and we finally reached a settlement in the September of that year. And that's when I started being a freelance journalist, which I have been now for, um, well, since um, late 20... Sorry, um, late 2000, so um, over uh, a long time now, uh, uh, best part of 10 years, uh, so 20 years. and um, uh, But that was very important for me because I felt I'd finally found my voice. It's not that at the FT or elsewhere that's suppressed. I mean, the FT is a brilliant place culturally 
uh, to be a journalist. Um, but um, I felt a, a real freedom to to um, range further and wider than I had before, and um, to you know pursue what what's my gut telling me? You know, what's my instinct? And you didn't me? have an editor curtailing. No, um, I say that slightly cautiously because as a freelancer, you uh, very importantly still have that relationship with the gatekeeper <laughs> yep. who decides whether your piece goes in the paper or not. And in fact, that was an issue as to why I left the Sunday Star Times um, um, three years ago was because um, the business editor at the time had, without discussing with me, Sorry, I back up one. I'd written a column about um, the Commerce Commission's ruling on the merger, proposed merger of NZ, me, and, and stuff. Yes. And um, I remember that. Uh, you were I, a naughty boy. Well, no, you did. I was <laughs> just doing my job. Um, the, I had written two columns about that before the um, uh, ruling. And, and the first one I said that on the publicly available information, because an awful lot had been redacted from their submissions to the Commerce Commission, on the publicly um, available information, they have failed to make the case as to why the merger would not only benefit them, they would solve their business problems, um, but would be good for journalism in New Zealand. That was column one. The next week, column two was, should they merge... This is how it should be handled. There should be um, a trust created um, to safeguard the journalistic principles here. Um, so I never said no. I was trying to offer a way forward. But in the Commerce Commission hearings, which I was uh, asked to um, speak to, the, edit, uh, the chief executive of staff at the time, um, who's still chief executive, um, said... I paraphrase, she said to the Commerce Commission, and um, just to demonstrate plurality of voices, you know, we even let Rod Oram, um, public, uh, who, who writes a column for the Sunday News, <laughs> um, uh, you know, write a column against the merger. And I, I interjected and said, I'll correct two things. Um, first of all, I actually write for the Sunday Star Times, not the Sunday News. But secondly, I never said no, and I laid out that two-part proposition. But anyway, uh, when the final decision came out, I um, gave um, that um, uh, judgment in my column. And um, the business editor at the time um, never discussed with me what was in the column. She had just taken out. Um, she said, I cannot allow you to use your column to um, accuse uh, Fairfax of having no strategy and, and suffering a loss of integrity and all the rest. Fortunately, I got an email on the Friday morning after she'd taken it out, but before it was published. And I called her up and said, well, you've got two problems. Um, first of all, um, with your permission, I publish my column every Sunday on a Facebook page. Um, and so I'll publish the full version, and people will ask questions as anyway. to... Yeah, anyway. Um, but secondly, um, um, the chief executive had told the Commerce Commission that I'm the poster boy of plurality. Um, you've just silenced my voice. <laughs> and thirdly, you've breached the most fundamental um, relationship in journalism. Um, because if writers and editors can't have those tough discussions uh, in private about have you got the facts, uh, are you being fair and reasonable before something's published, then you know we have no profession. And that role between editor and journalist, um, I, I've spent kind of half time either, on either end of that and I've always loved that discussion and that's why for example the Financial Times was so completely brilliant because um, some incredibly robust discussions unfortunately robust discussions normally means that people are banging the table and shouting each other I don't mean that I mean really laying out the facts laying out the arguments there you can have genuine well-grounded different sort of opinion and views so, but you've got to have those discussions before you publish anything, uh, Rod. It's it's uh, this is a so I quit. Right. Is the is long and short of that I, story. <laughs> I I I am um, fascinated in this topic of robust discussion and so forth. And I think that one of the greatest illustrations was in the film. And this is a bit left field, but the film uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. 
and and when Freddie Mercury goes off by himself, and he's shut, he's he, he left Queen and he'd gone off and done, you know. And when he came back, and they went, well, what happened? And he goes, well, I got some great musicians and I told them what to do, and they did it, and it was awful, mm. and he didn't have the rub that he had with Queen, who, you know, they often didn't agree and they they would argue about things and they would, you know, there would be all this sort of tension between them and, you know, great stuff came from that. Uh, And it's so important to have that rub and, uh, you know, to have those conversations because, you know, we, we, it's amazing what comes from that. That is so fundamentally important um, because it's the ability... um, to hold our relationships with each other um, in a way um, that we can have those discussions uh, and sometimes we might need to go and cool off a bit afterwards and have a deep think and draw a breath and go back. Um, but we've got to stay um, you know, in contact, in relationship. And what distresses me hugely about the world is um, we're seeing this... Um, polarization of politics, this mm. shattering of societies, um, because those um, fundamentally con- con- important connections are being broken, um, and they're being massively, deliberately broken um, by people who, um, you know, it's not that they love. It's not that they love to lie. They don't understand lying. They just say whatever is expedient to them. Um, to achieve what they want to do, regardless of fact, you know, damage, you yep. name it. Yep. So anyway, um, so th- so that's very much on my so, mind. So, Rob, that's going to lead us into our next topic um, very soon. But just today you write for Newsroom? Yes. Yep. Uh, and it's interesting. Just tell us quickly about Newsroom. Newsroom started... Um, um, best part of uh, well well over three years ago now uh, three key people um, Tim Murphy who was editor-in-chief at the Herald Mark Jennings who was head of um, news and current affairs at TV3 and Bernard Hickey uh, one of the founders of intrust.co.nz and then Hive News and um, what the three of them wrestled with and we were having I, I checked in little bits into that conversation when they were trying to work out how to get going um, is how on earth in a small, very small media market like this um, do you generate enough revenue to do good journalism? Because um, the journalistic and business models that have, have sort of underpinned my career have disappeared. So, for example, um, Google and Facebook um, scoop up um, well over 90%, more like 95% of all the online media advertising in New Zealand even though they don't generate any content. So it's completely useless for us at Newsroom to advertise. It, you know, it's a mugs game. So just, 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 hey, that's spooky, isn't it? It, it is fundamentally important. I mean, th- this was great data that came out in the Commerce Commission's investigation of NZME and stuff. And just to loop back to them, because it is a current issue, because they're trying desperately to merge and trying to persuade the government of this, they still haven't offered any view as to actually how they're going to make money. Their entire emphasis is on how we've got to rationalise and cut costs so somehow we can be more viable. But they're only going to be viable if they um, build revenue. And the um, Herald's performance on its paywall, um, it helps, but it's hardly going to keep them afloat, unlike you know massive papers like, say, the Financial Times. Um, and, um, it, and stuff, you know, won't have a bar of a paywall. And um, so they, they have no explanation. What is that? What's... A paywall? Yeah. Oh, that's where you have to subscribe to see stories. Right. And you can have a kind of a porous paywall. You yep. get 10 stories free a, year, a month or whatever, um, or a very strict paywall. And you can see how that model works where you have an infinitely large audience as if you were the New York Times or the Financial Times. But realistically, that's not true in New Zealand. So um, at Newsroom, we've got um, three uh, main sources of income. 
we have sponsorship um, from major organizations, but of course, um, obviously, uh, a complete um, Chinese wall, so to speak, um, between um, editorial and um, those commercial decisions. Um, secondly, subscription. So Newsroom Pro is our subscription service, twenty nine ninety five a month for single users. And, um, and well, that's bloody good value. It really is. Yeah, because, yep. I, I mean, I pay for that, and it means that... I end up with really good, clear information without a whole lot of other shit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then um, then we have the free side of our site, newsroom.co.nz. So my column appears on Newsroom Pro 8 o'clock Friday morning, and then on the free side of the site, 8 o'clock Sunday morning. Yeah. And um, then the third um, element is donations. And... Um, that's quite fascinating because um, we can see the data quite clearly as to um, – it's, it's hard to predict sometimes – as to why a particular story will um, encourage somebody just to click the donate button. But that's – it's not big revenue, but it's a really important revenue because it's a, um, it's it's a real, under, it's it's a real connection. Yeah. It's an indicator, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So um, we are growing audience, um, growing readers. Uh, we're growing um, subscribers. Uh, we're growing the number of journalists, and we're keeping our head above water. And um, my role's minor. I, I'm, I do my weekly column. I chip in a few thoughts every now and then and love helping especially the younger journalists because I always love to help encourage um, people in their work and um, uh, you know I'm obviously not entirely objective but I think we're doing good work okay and then the other part of my week is very straightforward um, I have two very long-standing radio pieces, um, nine to noon on Radio New Zealand on Tuesday mornings. Um, and so I'll be going straight from here, slightly hoarse from all this talking to do today's um, piece. And then um, on um, uh, Wednesdays with News Talk ZB. I must just tell you a story about News Talk ZB. Um, I did that for uh, over 20 years, 20, 22 years, 21 years with Larry Williams. Yes. And... Um, and when I was at the Herald, we would do a cross every night about 6.30. But after I left the Herald, we just did it once a week. I only ever met Larry once um, and, and did a piece uh, face-to-face. And that was one budget night in about 1999. I think it was still at the Herald. And, um, but we'd always do it by phone. But on the occasions that... He, I had a timing problem, or what, um, and we pre-recorded. We'd have a bit of a chat before we would actually go live. But over that time, we developed this amazing nano relationship, and we, I think quite different views. We we knew what we disagreed about, um, and we still could talk about them. And um, so we did that for a long time. So when he had a, when he retired last year, I was determined to go into the studio right. for, for only the second and last time. And we had such a good chat on air. And I said to him, well, you know, Larry, I've been working out that over the last you know, 22 years, um, these nano times we've spent together add up to about you know, uh, 10 days of work life. But I think we kind of got to know each other a bit. And it was just a huge treat. Uh, to have done that and then it's delightful to have moved on to Heather and to Plessis Allen now she's, she's very different from um, Larry and, um, and and keeps me on my toes right. so those are the fixed points in my week uh, one column two radio pieces then I just do lots of speaking engagements and um, um, all sorts of other um, things that I justify as journalism so we've just ticked off the first of five topics. And we've right? already been going for and, and, half an you hour. Know, it's funny because I was sitting here going, <laughs> how do I get this bastard to speed up? I'm going, it's really interesting. Because <laughs> when I do the podcast, I sit there and go, would I listen to this? And, uh, you know, I'm really pleased we went through that, Rod, because uh, it gives some credibility to the next part, right? Mm. Because uh, I did want people to listen to the richness of what you've been through mm. before we get on to the next next part. We do have to get you to Radio New Zealand by a certain time. You do. And, and I think the listeners won't see this, of course. I think you need to give me a little signal, you know. Wait, oh, wait, mate, I was enjoying it too much. And don't <laughs> fucking tell me how to run my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I... Um, uh, no, seriously, I... 
uh, I would have done that if I thought it was if I thought it was one boring and two not relevant because um, so we're going to crack on and we're going to be a bit more and I'm giving the, the signal yes, that yes. I was giving but I think now we can we can crack on and look at this next part of what is going on in the world and uh, we talked Rod and I talked about this before to make sure I didn't get too specific on economics or, or whatever. And I'm going to trust you, Rod, to, to kick off on where you want to kick off, on where you see the world is at at the moment. My great pleasure. And, and I will start with absolutely my central preoccupation, which is how many people there are on the planet. Yep. So when I was born in 1950, there were 2.4 billion people in the world. That's the same population today as just India and China. Mm-hmm. So the year I was born, it was as though we all lived in India and China and nobody lived anywhere else. Um, since then, human population has more than trebled. And indeed, in the time I've been a business journalist, it's doubled. So there's a lot of good stuff about that. Um, uh, a much higher proportion of populations... Uh, uh, have better nutrition, health, education, science, not nearly enough, but some good proportion access to some sort of political process that serves them. And um, so we know a lot more, we are a lot more capable. So um, I never lose sight of all those gains. However, uh, we are now, (laughs) it's a very crucial stage, where the way we do things has such a damaging impact on the living systems of the planet. And the planet is our life support system. So my central preoccupation is how do we make sure that um, a growing population, and and I'll come back to that question of could we not grow the population, um, if we get to, say, 10 billion people in 2050, um, the human population will have quadrupled in my lifetime. I, I'm very focused on getting to 2050. Right. My 100th birthday, which is right. why well, my well done. Yep. email address is rod.orum at nz2050.com. <laughs> anyway, so my central preoccupation is how do we, what do we need to change and how do we change it so that 10 billion people can live well on the planet? Now, a question that always comes up in discussions is, well, shouldn't we have fewer people? And I go, well... There's two problems with that. The first is that any time humans try to intervene in suppressing population, uh, we get um, huge demographic skews. Um, so we get um, you know, female you know, girl babies killed off. Uh, we get excess men. Um, China now, because of its one-child policy, has the fastest aging population um, in the world. Um, because they've got so few children. Right. And it must be mind-bending being a grandchild uh, with so many you know, grandparents all focused on you. Um, quite distorting your life. So, um, but we do know that, um, by and large, as people uh, have a better life, feel more secure, they have fewer children. So it seems to me the far more humane thing is to make sure that... Um, we look after people well, then they'll have fewer children, then the human population will plateau. Now, back to 10 billion people. There's also a correlation with, with education. Too, yes, isn't yeah, yeah, all of those things. Yep. But um, the way we do things now is unsustainable. We're using you know, resources from more than one planet, i.e. our rate of extraction, um, and um, we can't, even if we, those of us who have cut back that would still not generate enough for those who don't have. It's not a question about sharing what we do now. It's about fundamentally changing everything we need to do to make sure that we work with nature, not against it. So we help ecosystems recover so they are more resilient and more productive. They make sure that when we use resources, we completely unmake the product we've done. So in a circular economy, we can use everything all over again. And that's not to say we have some simple, you know, um, hermit-like existence in sackcloth and ashes. No, we can do that well, so we can live well. So that's my central preoccupation. What do we have to do to help 10 billion people live well on this planet by 2050? That's, that's, that's 
and I'm a business journalist, so um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about that in terms of, well, if I'm in a business, what do I need to respond to? How do I change? What role can I play? Because, uh, you know, for all the problems that business can cause, I, I still believe incredibly strongly that businesses are great um, um, places for bringing people together to innovate and to work and to do good stuff. It's just making sure that we're doing the right stuff. Yeah, and, you know, we're a big corp, and I'm really passionate about, you know, commerce is not going to go away. I don't think commerce is going to disappear. Commerce will continue. Uh, and then how do we turn that into a force for good? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, you talk of the circular thing. It's interesting. I'm, I've got a meeting uh, later on this morning, and we're getting some T-shirts designed for, for the business, mm-hmm. and they will be made by Little Yellow Bird. Oh, yes. And yeah. the reason they'll be made for them is that we know when the T-shirts are finished, they'll take them back and they'll unpack it and they will reuse the cotton. Yeah, you know, and that's a big motivator for me that they would be the only company in New Zealand uh, that I would use to to make those those t-shirts. Um, I will just pick up on that very briefly because um, I've long helped out uh, with the Sustainable Business Network amongst various organisations I, I get involved with, and um, I was um, in the um, yet again this past year as one of the judges in their awards. And uh, Little Yellow Bird not only won its category of hardwired for social good, um, but also won the Supreme Award, mm-hmm. um, i.e. The, the best of the category winners. And um, it's a young con- company that um, uh, still got a ways to go on its journey. Um, but that in itself is important, that um, it's a company that shows that it can learn fast uh, and um, b- be very clear about what it's trying to do. So... Uh, I, um, I, I think they're a very good example of the sort of companies and cultures um, that we need in this. Yeah. Okay, so it's population. So it's around security, uh, it's around education and working out how the population's and not meddling in it too much. What do you think about it, it Bill Gates's concept of this, this birth control pill that women can take just once a month that he's developing? Are you up with that? Um, No, I'm not. Uh, And um, I can um, see merits in that um, because that takes um, the anxiety and worry out of that for um, women who are um, still of childbearing age. So uh, that sounds to me like a very good thing. Um, um, Sure beats abstinence. Um, um, But I want to go back to a, a fundamental point. Um, There is a real hierarchy of of, of needs, if you like, in this. Um, And I I suppose I'm slightly misquoting Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, but but in a way I'm not, because the first one is the first um, need is to um, have the necessities of life. But the point is that we humans are doing so much damage to ecosystems that we are absolutely destroying the systems that give us the necessities of life. So we're fundamentally attacking the the basic principle uh, underlying that hierarchy of needs. And we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. So yes, that population story is important and good on Bill Gates for having a once a month um, Look, it's a wee way off yet. Yeah. And, and, you know, from but we've got to get our head around this fact and um, uh, the essential fact that um, if we don't figure out all the ways that we are uh, undermining our life support system uh, and we are it's reducing its capacity to look after us and if we don't turn that around and time is incredibly short it's not just about climate change it is about what we do to oceans it's about um, what we do to um, biodiversity um, uh, it's what we do to land use which is why um, I spend so much time in the primary sector Um, this is what we need to focus on and um, so I'm always bringing the conversation back to that and it's not that I I I suppose in one sense I am obsessed by that but of course um, 
dealing with those issues and then take you out all the way to some very fundamental questions about human nature and how we relate and respond. So that's why, um, to me, it becomes um, about everything, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, because I wanted to mind. So, you know, ecosystems are a fascinating thing, Rod, and I... My education, I didn't really understand or wasn't really that interested in ecosystems. Yeah. Likewise, I mean, I, you know, I studied biology at school and it was dissecting, you know, a bullseye or something. Yeah. You know, it was like, well, that's kind of nice. I, I mean, know. I think I've only understood biodiversity in the last five years. Yeah. Um, and I know I only understand a, a tiny part of it, but just how biodiversity changes everything. It does. And um, there was an absolutely fabulous film in the wonderfully fabulous uh, Dock Edge Film Festival that we have here in Auckland and then they run in Wellington every year. Last year there was a, a wonderful um, documentary, people could possibly find it online, called Serengeti Rules. And it was about um, the work that um, a, um, an ecologist uh, in Africa did um, in the Serengeti Game Park to work out that um, there was what he called a keystone species on which that ecosystem relied. Conventionally, we would think of that being the top predator, in that case, the lions. But it wasn't. The keystone species was the wildebeest, um, one level down. And it was the self-regulating mechanisms between all the species in that ecosystem, but the wildebeest were the key. But this wonderful film explored how other um, ecologists were understanding that in different ecosystems around the world, but had never connected. And it was about how, I think from about the 1970s onwards, they began to connect. And so our knowledge of ecosystems um, is still very rudimentary, but we've got to pay attention to them. Um, And we've got to understand they are astonishingly complex and that we humans are not smart enough to run them. We've got to let ecosystems um, run themselves um, and not get in the way of them. Yes, we should, should avail ourselves of what an ecosystem can offer us, but to be very careful not to overexploit it um, or to um, do damage to its systems that un- undermine its resilience and its productivity. So you, that's... that's... That's sort of like what you were saying before, Rod, with the human population as an ecosystem. And when we dabble in it, and when we, when we think we know what's best of not having female babies in China and so forth, things go tits up, don't they? They are. And we think of ourselves as the top species, we think we're the, the top predator. Actually, we aren't. There was a wonderful book out last year about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes have killed far more humans than humans have killed. So the top predator is actually the mosquito. (laughs) 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 Sorry, that's... No, I just think we could have an armed force. Well, it it, it reminds me of an Anita Roddick story from from the body shop. And uh, she was a wonderful woman. uh, And... um, uh, when her business finally um, uh, collapsed, at least with her running it, there was a wonderful quote from a London analyst, I was in, still in London at the time, um, that an Anita um, dogma got run over by her karma. <laughs> but, the point, but the point was, she said, if you think you're ineffectual, try sleeping with a mosquito. Right, <laughs> right, right. Sorry, we digress. Move on from mosquitoes. Rod, so, Rod, what? So, the, the uh, so population ecosystems. Um, I'm really interested in democracy and where democracy is at in the world today, because it seems really uh, shaky. Yes, I'm going to make. Um, I'll say some things about that, but then make a connection back here to New Zealand, which connects back to that ecosystem stuff in one sense. Um, democracy is very, very shaky. Um, we're finding it um, pretty much in every country around the world uh, really difficult to maintain democratic institutions um, because of um, the nature of information, um, the way it's being exploited politically, and therefore the way it's causing the shattering of society. And um, for me... Uh, there's a whole lot of work to do to reinvent democracy. So there are wonderful examples around the world 
actually in the states. So, for example, the state of Maine now has a different voting system um, than the other states in terms of um, a, a bit more like a proportional... Rep- um, this is a imperfect paraphrase here. Um, it, in a sense, it offers you something like a proportional representation system, a weighted voting system. Um, so um, the, can- the, per- the candidate that wins the top number of votes is not a winner takes all for a congressional seat or senate um, but it's um, it, there's a there's a waiting there so you, you someone will come through who may not have won the most outright but um, in terms of the ranking of candidates um, they appeal to more people overall than the, the the top person did how do you know that um, because of the of the of, of the of the waiting system uh, right. of, of how people have prioritised their votes, right? So um, very early stage and, and uh, of reinventing democracy. And I, I'm picking American examples here because it's in many ways one of the most broken democracies. Yeah, because I was going to say, fascinating. You've picked America, which I see as their democracy is in real strife. Yeah. So at another stage, uh, another example would be uh, participatory budget making. Now, obviously, that happens only in in cities uh, or much smaller government units. But it's um, a tiny taste of how we help people feel more engaged in what's going on in the political process. So I um, am determined over the next few years to do an awful lot more work around that. And... uh, but I'll link that straight back to New Zealand because if you look at the Economist Intelligence Unit's um, annual democracy index, which is a very data-driven piece of research, um, New Zealand ranks fourth in that as, as the most effective democracy. But eight of the ten top countries have populations of less, uh, 10 million or less. Right. And I think that's really important. I think it's, um, I can see how you can make democracy work in a small country because you still have some sort of connection. Then, of course, we have um, a MMP system, which means that we don't get um, the, quite the same polarisation in Parliament um, that you get in first-past-the-post systems. And, and, and thus, as we see in the States, we see in the UK, this amazing manipulation of um, the two main parties um, by... Um, people with particular agendas and ideologies, uh, which then destroy um, the natural range of views that you used to have um, in those um, large or powerful parties. So uh, huge work to do on democracy, um, and I think we've hardly begun to think about um, how we can make democracy more credible, more effective, um, empower people. Um, so that's, that's one issue that's very much on my mind. Rod, does it does it concern you that we won't get it sorted out? Uh, yes. Um, however, and I I always feel this is a bit sort of weedy. Uh, you know, it's a, a bit sort of um, um, you know Panglossian to say well, it's the best of all times or the best of all things. Is the sense that. Uh, this is a huge race. Humankind is... Head, I'm mixing my metaphors here is quite lemming-like rushing for the cliff. And we might well tumble over. But if we stop trying to put this right, it really is all over. So um, all any of us can do is, uh, however, uh, and each of us can only do a tiny thing, um, if we each do our tiny thing to um, try to turn that around, maybe we will. Um, and um, is to have um, the courage and the conviction, you know, to play your role. You know, each of us yeah. um, is um, can only do an infinitesimally small thing. But if an infinite number of us do our infinitesimally small thing, then that's power, that's change. So talking to people, trying to explain things, trying to understand where people are coming from and... Um, and trying to help them on their journey um, is so important to me. So the key thing there is actually listening to other people as well. Rather, isn't yes, it? and I, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm not as good as that um, as I need to be because I find as, as things have got more and more complicated 
um, and more and more urgent, um, it, it seems too hard so often to take the time um, to just chill, just relax, just hear what the other person's saying, finding a way to connect. And um, again, I come back to this idea that in New Zealand we are a small, well-connected society. And I'll leap this back to the ecosystem one, because when Paul Callahan first said in his last speech before he died, uh, threw out the really important challenge of making New Zealand predator-free, um, I thought that was crazy. I, I hugely enjoyed Paul. Uh, we would have some great discussions. We agreed on quite a few things. Um, we disagreed on the role of agriculture. He thought there was no real future for New Zealand in that. I think there is. Um, but um, initially, I thought that was a completely crazy idea about being predator-free. It was impossible to do. Um, it would be a distraction. Um, but the more I've understood about the importance of ecosystems, um, I've realized it is important. But what finally convinced me about this was I saw what was happening in communities where you would find, um, you know, in the smallest little town or in the country or, or part of a big town, you'd get people really committed um, to this predator-free work who would normally hate each other. They would, they'd, yeah. they'd cross the street, thought, well, there's a mad bugger, that possum catcher, I don't want anything to do with him. But, um, and I, I found that so socially quite fascinating. And I think um, ecosystems and our love of nature and our understanding of nature um, will be the thing here in New Zealand um, that does bring us um, um, into better connection with each other to be more effective on these issues. Fascinating. So the love of nature, you think, is our is going to be our thing that binds us? Yes. But I want to offer a really big caveat. We are really strange people here in New Zealand because we are more urbanised as a population than people in France, Germany, the UK. In other words, a higher proportion of us live in towns and cities. Now, albeit they're small towns and cities and close to the country. But as a people, we still identify ourselves as people and as a nation, you know, our economy, by our rural and wild places. But the primary sector, um, even second order magnitude, i.e. A, a job in, a, in the warehouse in Ashburton, uh, are the jobs there because farmers are spending money. But... Um, it's really struggled to get to about 12% of GDP has got anything to do with the primary sector at all. There's a lot of other stuff going on in New Zealand. Yes, it's a big part of exports. That's true. But um, we still define ourselves by our rural and wild parts, which is true. But I think we have an over-romanticized sense of that. And I think that and, and in two ways... I know that farmers, many farmers care about their land, but they're feeling very defensive now because they feel that um, townies are after them for on water and all sorts of other issues. And um, there's some farmers out there who I think have a bigger understanding about their relationship with an ecosystem, um, but all of farmers need to move on. I mean, I... I uh, to deepen that understanding. And I'll come back to that. Deepen I, understanding of ecosystems. Yeah, and what yep. their roles are in them. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the future mm -hmm. of food later on in the conversation. But co similarly, though, um, we um, urbanites in New Zealand um, have no expression of what it means to be um, uh, a urban New Zealander deeply embedded in an ecosystem. So here in Auckland, in Tamaki Makoro, we have these three gorgeous harbours, um, the Waitemata, the Manukau, and the bottom end of the Kaipara. Um, we have these gorgeous ranges, the Hanuas and the Waitakaris, and the, and the black beaches on the west coast, the white beaches on the east coast. Um, and um, this is an incredible isthmus um, and ecosystem. But we have plonked a city in the middle of it, um, where we are woefully inadequate, um, whether it's still putting storm water into the harbours, um, whether it's um, pumping um, waste water and, and storm water, all, 
this huge distance across the city, pretty much all of it back to Mangare to process. And, and so what would uh, it take as we develop uh, Tamaki Makoro um, to make sure we develop it in much stronger ecosystem senses? So we're bringing nature fundamentally back into the city, not in a, uh, uh, you know, a pretty way like trees in a park. That's nice. Um, but how would we produce more food in the city, for example? And how would we link um, all of our human systems um, in the city um, to support that? And it's not to do farmers out of their living, um, but it's um, to better connect. So that's why. So that's my caveat, that I, I think this is one of the keys to how we progress as a country, what's distinctive about us as a country and as a people. But crucially, though, um, we need to really up our understanding of uh, what is our relationship with ecosystems um, in our built environment, in our towns and cities, but also in our natural environment, in our rural and wild parts. And so that's town planning, that's um, uh, um, landscaping, that's bu- buildings, how they interact, a whole range of things, isn't it, connecting? Yeah, and there's so won- wonderful things people can do. So, for example, we have these amazing bird sanctuaries out here um, in, um, the, uh, in the Gulf, uh, Tiri Tiri, for example. But if each of us... Um, um, planted native plants in our gardens um, and we um, did more to revive our reserves with native plants and the rest we would create these little um, islands uh, which then becomes an archipelago uh, across um, the um, the city for those um, um, for those um, native birds to be able to spread outside to Rotini. and then of course at the same time you know, I live in um, Mission Bay, we've got um, you know, the Eastern Songbird Project um, to deal with predators to help bring that back. So there's all these sorts of things that we can each do our infinitesimally small thing to help rebuild ecosystems. So, Rod, just, you know, this is interesting because this is a, I, I love surprises, so this is a surprise in this conversation that that uh, our, our, that maybe the love of nature and the, and the understanding building ecosystems uh, and then how we fit into those ecosystems as a human race could be one of the keys for our survival of the planet and of, of, of us. Yes. To me, it's everything. Mm. And that, that... Well, life is not quite that simple. But... but but for me, that is absolutely the bedrock principle. Mm. And, um, you know, we used to talk about saving the planet. Well, th- we understood a long time ago that's nonsense because um, through its four and a half billion year history to date, um, the planet has gone through enormous changes and um, wiped out, uh, we used to think five, it's now possibly only four mass extinctions. Um, but um, the nature of life has fundamentally changed, radically changed. Um, and um, maybe it will change again um, mm. and in ways that uh, wipes us humans out and some other species will evolve. So, you know, selfishly, in a sense, we're trying to save ourselves in this. Um, but um, uh, in doing so, we would be giving, we, we would be taking our foot off the neck of nature and giving it a chance to um, recover. And of course, we. Ecosystems are so amazing because they evolve. You never go backwards. We can't recreate um, uh, an Aotearoa that was pre-human. Um, ecosystems evolve, um, but the, health of the healthier they are, um, the more abundantly they w- will evolve. So um, rather than... In, I'm, making, I'm not a scientist. I don't know whether it works out this way. The, rather than... Um, you know, a barren ecosystem that you know evolves into multiple species of cockroaches. Um, you have an abundant ecosystem that has this glorious diversity of life, um, and so that's that's the next chapter of the planet's history. Mm. We, we, I think we are coming to the end of a, hu- a short human chapter, um, where it's like a thriller. You know, we've we humans have set up all these horrible problems 
Um, and as we turn the page into a new chapter, we wonder how on earth are they going to get out of this? Yes. <laughs> Yes. And it's a real page turner because yeah <laughs> yeah and it's starting to get all quite tense now isn't it absolutely and it's it's what's driving people apart um, it's uh, you know we are still compounding our problems Rod the you know I, I heard yesterday just uh, talking about the ecosystem and and so forth the, the uh, there was a woman and I haven't listened to it yet but there's a woman setting up a regenerative program within the city of Auckland now it's based around bees and how to set up an ecosystem that bees can flourish yeah. in Auckland City. Yeah, that's Sarah Smuts-Kennedy. Uh, yeah. I greatly admire what she's, she's doing. And it's, it's dead right. And it's this quite intriguing thing um, that um, is identified around the world is that um, because of blanket um, insecticides um, and pesticides used um, in farming systems, um, it turns out that um, maybe cities are sanctuaries um, for the likes of bees. Fascinating. Um, which is very interesting. Um, but if we're going to offer sanctuaries to bees, so then that they can repopulate back out into back out in the, in the uh, once we um, pull back on um, on some of the um, more damaging of the pesticides and insecticides. Um, but w- we would need to support the bees here um, to give them the best chance of um, expanding back out. And Rod, we've 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 gone off the schedule slightly, and and I'm okay with that because we've sort of hit this thing of the love of nature and ecosystems, mm. which uh, was on the list here. But it's I'm intrigued that this is this is such a big part of where you see us heading. Yeah, we've we're just converting our little block at home into regenerative agriculture, and. Uh, I've never been more interested. I farm for thirty years. I'm now more intrigued as to what is going on in the land than I ever was. So when I got trained uh, through Lincoln and so forth, it was all about what happened above the ground, really. Okay, so we were never really trained to look under the ground. We were trained everything happened above the ground. The more grass you grew, it was all about harvesting the grass. And that was the key to being a good farmer. Grow lots of grass and harvesting it as efficiently as possible. And now I'm really interested in what the hell is going un- on under the ground. And I can see as we... Um, and I feel like an 18-year-old again because I'm so ignorant about what is going on. And I realise I don't know what is going on. And so I'm going through this this process of wonder right now and I'm frustrated because it's taking longer than I would like. Uh, and what is going just, you know, it needs to transition and we're adding um, compost and humus and all this stuff back onto the land and, and going away from a traditional system into this regenerative system. And it's really exciting. I'm deeply envious of you and other farmers who are on that journey because um, I just think it would be absolutely thrilling and mind expanding um, to um, have that level of learning and and to see the land come back uh, and to flourish now um, I've I've always loved gardens um, but I've never been anything of a gardener I was really good at cutting grass you know nice strips alternate colours alternate shades of green Um, but that's about the end of it and um, I, and it's not that I want my life all over again and I'll come back as a farmer. Well, actually, that would be pretty good. Um, but I am deeply envious uh, because I think that is um, your fingers, your souls in, in that soil um, in, in, a, in a way that mine isn't when I'm talking about companies. But, uh, no, maybe that's not true because um, I suppose um, my humus that I... I'm dealing with is people um, it, you know th- that that's my ecosystem in a sense is people that um, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, ha- how we make that re- ecosystem more resilient and, and the thing that we're noticing Rod is that um, so we've gone from sort of a monoculture mm. to um, adding all these different species in, and uh, and look it's, it's, if you saw it right now it's very very messy and it's not working yet Uh but it will. Um, but where it is working 
you can see, so it's February, it's coming up February, it's dry, we're on sand country, and where the species have taken, deep-rooted species have taken, the species around them are flourishing, who are not deep-rooting, and the the you can see the plants working together in these little areas of a few metres and going, what's happening there? Which is not happening just over there. And they're only metres apart where one is working and one's not. And so it's fascinating, even when it's dry on sand country, that plants are flourishing, they're dark green and they're healthy and they're, you can see they're helping each other out. That's completely fascinating because there, there's a symbiosis there. Yep, yeah. and I don't, I don't know what's going on, but I've never... And the interesting thing is the biggest benefit of this so far is our mental health. Ah. Right? Because... Well, tell me more about that. Because well, we... I, because we are now part, we feel connected to the soil, hmm. right? Never felt connected to the soil before. And we know that we are having a impact on our immediate environment. We know we've got more birds around and we've got more species of birds around. So we know there are two new species of birds moved in that weren't there before. Now, is that a direct result of us or not? Don't know. Or maybe we've just noticed it. Don't know. But uh, we know that we are now having a positive impact on our environment. And that changes our mental health. And, uh, you know, and while I'm frustrated that it's not going faster, because as an industrial farmer of old, it was all about doing it quickly, where I can't make this go quickly and I can't control it. Um, I can aid it, but I can't control it. And so I've got to give that up. Uh, and that's not natural for me. You know, I'm a white fella. I like controlling stuff. That's what I was brought up to do. So I'm having to let go of that and allow nature to do its thing. But that is... And then seeing the wonder of the unpredictable stuff that's coming at us. Mm. It's quite different. It is, and um, I, I spend a lot of time um, on those issues, and particularly with um, some of my fellow Edmund Hillary fellows, because we have some uh, real strengths around regenerative agriculture. And um, f- from what I see from their work with farmers is that um, they are working with farmers who are managing to transition their farming systems relatively quickly um, over sort of um, two, three, four years. And, and you, you'll see the progress quite quickly. Yep. And they're able to um, farm profitably through that. But the fear for many, uh, which is quite understandable, is that if I let go of this system that I've honed and people tell me is the state of the art now, uh, but I've got this bank debt and I, I worry about um, you know a, a bad year's farming um, or poor prices or whatever... Um, I, I, there's a valley. It's it's like Silicon Valley. There's, there's, this, yep. uh, there's the, the the valley of death in the, as you get from the startup phase and before you finally climb out to viability. So I'm really keen on um, uh, finding mechanisms to help um, support farmers through that. Not so much by um, having some sort of guaranteed subsidy program, but having a safety net. And just so they know that that safety net's there should they need it. But let me tell you a terrible story. So that that, that exists in the States, right? There are systems like that in the States. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and to help transition farmers across. Now, their soils are a lot worse state than our soils, apparently. Mm. But it's interesting and that's helping. What's interesting is hardly ever being used. So farmers are are transitioning... um, quite quickly and profitably to do that. Anyway. I'll tell you a terrible story about that. Um, And um, I'm not, in a sense, picking on bankers, or in this case, I'm not going to name the bank, the particular bank involved here, because I know that um, uh, agricultural lenders have, have done a classic thing of pursuing a strategy that had limits, but they've pushed it beyond where it should be. So 
we were having a discussion, this was back about three months ago, about these sorts of issues about farming. And they were saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, farm prices are holding up pretty well, but not many farms are being sold um, um, because farmers can't get the price they want for them and we bankers are hanging in there with them. And so, well, yes, um, but there would be more sales if you let the market operate. And I don't mean just cutting mm-hmm. the bank, the farmers adrift. But what would it take to... Um, and the stress on farmers through that is just unbelievable. It's inhumane. I said, what would it take if you um, got together half a dozen farmers who you know are really good farmers, but they're in a bit of a jam? They have got too much debt because they, for example, um, have put in um, an irrigation system, um, but some rules have changed in a water catchment, or, or whatever the issue is. So, or, or they've, um, they've been um, uh, after the neighbouring farm for years because it, they've been leasing it, the land, because it's integral to their farming system. And all of a sudden, that farm, after 30 years, is up for sale. Um, and But now you know, they have loaded themselves up to buy it because it's integral to their farming system and it's they're struggling with the debt. What would it take if you um, got half a dozen of these farms together and, and worked with them on this journey and, and had that safety net with them um, as they transition to, um, I would argue, a healthier farming system, financially in other ways? And, and this chap turned to his colleague and said, you know, I, I'm not sure we could get that through the, you know, we'd have to have the, the, when, uh, the, the hurdle rate for projects like that would be 12%. And I said, what? You were saying that you'd have to put some capital to that. Oh, well, yeah, we would. And the hurdle rate would be 12%. He said, yeah. And I said, well, that's insane. In a period of ultra-low interest rates, your hurdle rate for a capital for a project is 12%. And he was embarrassed. And I said, well, you should be embarrassed (laughs) because that's... I I don't use the word lightly. That's usury. Yeah. Um, And um, so there's some big mindsets that need to change. So just explain that hurdle rate. That's where um, in the bank uh, uh, you say, well, we've got this great project. We need some capital for it. And you have to justify that capital. And um, they, uh, you know, you've got to demonstrate it will generate a 12% return. Um, Otherwise, you don't get the capital. Well, you know, you don't get a 12% return at the casino. I mean, man, that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. That is completely insane. And it's and it is going to stop anything happening. But exactly. It is absolutely stifling yep. killing off the innovation that needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Look I had um uh yeah, look I won't I won't go down that rabbit hole, but it's it's uh the banks are going to have to reinvent themselves somehow or there's going to be new models turn up, which most probably are happening now. No, I, I'm not saying, you know, bad guys, bankers. It, it's such a human thing that um, you, you, you design and tune up a system that hums like an absolute machine, cranks out lots of money, um, and, and, and you just keep going yeah. until you run out of road. Um, and, of course, um, one needs to change before you actually... Yeah. So, Rod, I'm, I'm mindful of time, and I'm very pleased that we're going to do this annually. Because <laughs> I'll, be, I'll bring Lynn next time. <laughs> because because uh, seriously, there is there is uh, uh, there is the, the problem with you. There is so much we can talk about. Um, the generalist would be a lot better mm. next year. Be a specialist, and then we can focus <laughs> on that. So, and and Rod, we've we've we've. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, what should we do with the rest the, to, to wind this up? Just give us a view of what are you going to work on for the next five years? That's quite clear in my mind. <laughs> I do have a plan. Um, come June of 2025, I will have been a business journalist for 50 years. Now, I'm calling that my, my retirement time. I mean, I, I'll always be a journalist. I'll keep doing stuff. Um, but... Setting that deadline um, has focused my mind. Uh, I've always worked best under deadline pressure. So what I want to do over these next five and a half years um, is to be thinking an awful lot about the future, um, but well in for- along the lines we've discussed. 
but very informed by where we are at the present. But I also want to be able to pull some things through from the past. And um, I first did this in my 2016 book, um, Three Cities um, Seeking Hope in the Anthropocene, little Bridget Williams um, BWB text, where I went to um, Beijing, London and Chicago, three cities I'd known very well for a very long time, and asked people, what's the nexus, what's the relationship between ecology and economics for you 10 years from now? But in that journey, I was also looking back because I'd known those cities for a very long time. I lived a long time in London and Chicago, not Beijing, but I first visited Beijing, as I mentioned, mm-hmm. in 1979. And um, I discovered something quite fascinating that, of course, you don't remember the past accurately. But also I realized, looking back, what I should have known at the time but didn't. Uh, And therefore that helped me try to tune in to what might I be missing now that, in retrospect, that I realize I should have known. So um, to me there is a journey here. And the journey is about growing up in Birmingham when it was the workshop of the world. But by the time I was at university, uh, we were starting to see China rising. And, of course, the revival of China is absolutely the dominant feature of my business career. Uh, Kind of like everything leads back to that. And hugely important for us here in New Zealand and our relationship with China. So I'm on this journey about trying to understand how we progress, but I want to think about that past and present and future and kind of triangulate, if you like, between past, present and future, between um, Birmingham, Beijing and Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, so to do that, um, that's the metaphorical journey. The physical journey is um, I've always loved cycling and what I'm about to say is probably just indulgent and an excuse for doing lots of cycling. Um, But I love cycling. You get to see people, you get to see things. So um, February 17th uh, this year, um, I'm riding Tour Aotearoa from Cape Rienga to Bluff, 3,000 kilometres off-road. Off-road? Mostly it's two-thirds off-road. Yeah. And um, I've done Cape Rienga to Bluff before, but that was on-road in uh, 2010. Right. Where we um, came down the – we averaged 165K a day – um, down came down the North Island seven days and the South Island in six, bit some big days in the South Island. And that was the great ride for the Heart Foundation. Um, but anyway, um, so that's this year. And the 30 days limit is it's a, a brevet. So do you do that by yourself? In the company of others. You yep. have to be self-supporting. You're GPS tracked. So right. if you leave the route to go off to a pub or to right. accommodation or take a shortcut... You have to come back to where you'd left the route. Right. And you have a minimum of 30 days to do it and a max, sorry, a minimum of 10 days. There are crazy buggers who ride 300k a day and camp outside in the cargo on the ninth, sorry, outside Bluff on the ninth night so they could just roll into Bluff the next morning. But a maximum of 30 days. So it's a, it's a European style cycling mm-hmm. event called a brevet or an Howdax. And um, so that's what I'm doing. You've got to be self supporting, you know, carry a tent food stuff you, know, you can shop yep. stop at the pub um, and uh, so that's this year then um, I've had long had an ambition to cycle from Beijing to Birmingham well sorry it started off as Birmingham to Beijing but for various practical reasons I'm starting in Beijing on May the 14th next year uh, in the company of a wonderful um, Canadian company called Tour d'Afrique that supports long distance rides right. and um, so next year I cycle f- um, from um, Beijing to Istanbul so you go up from Beijing into Mongolia come through a corner of Russia and then down through the Stans and then Iran and not Afghanistan thankfully and then into Turkey and that's uh, cycling 120 kilometers a day six days a week for 23 weeks <laughs> and 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 Rod I'm, I'm guessing that's not all downhill um on average it, it, it's zero because you end up back at sea level so right. it, you know, there's a lot of up and down yeah. and uh, it's going to be a big challenge mentally and physically I think um, and then um, I'll go back to Istanbul um, spring of 2022 and cycle from Istanbul to Birmingham um, and um, I want to write about the ride but it'll be kind of light because on the on the ride because quite frankly you spend a lot of time on a bike but it most of it's 
that wouldn't uh, be very interesting you know, to other people. I, 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 I don't <laughs> think it'll be light. I think you will encounter stuff that that you're not that will be unpredictable. It will be an amazing adventure because I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I'm just going to be thankful I'll be able to do it. Yeah, and um, but this. You know, there's technology involved. I thought long and hard about the bike I'm riding, the gear I'm taking, right. I'm training myself um, with the help of others. So that's um, – and so I'd like to think there will be perhaps um, a little book out of that, which will be kind of about the ride from um, Cape Rienga to Bluff and then from Beijing to Birmingham. And but so, uh, Rod, you will be riding back into Birmingham at what age? I will be not quite 72 when I right. arrive in Birmingham. Yeah, that's quite a journey, isn't it? <laughs> well, this is why I'm working with the University of um, Auckland's Health and Rehabilitation Clinic because I consider myself a jerry athlete <laughs> given my age. Yeah. So I started working with them last year just to make sure that I, I you know, build up the, you know, the strength and flexibility. Yeah. I mean, I've always cycled, but this is quite a schedule. And uh, they're wonderful. And I've got a good cycling coach who keeps me going in my spin classes and my training schedule. Will, will there be an event in Birmingham when you get there? Um, I would hope to turn up outside 21 New Tree Road in Edgbaston, which is the house I was born in. <laughs> and um, it would just be good to have a few family and friends there. Yeah. I need to be in touch with the people of 21 New Tree yeah. Road. So, uh, who is this person in the front garden? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> haggard, haggard and road weary. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, no, I, I, but then I'm going to spend some time in Birmingham because Birmingham, of course, has moved on hugely. It's, yeah. it's, there is huge industry in Birmingham of a highly specialised nature. It's no longer the workshop of the world. But I think some of the characteristics that gave rise to the Industrial Revolution, I'm reading a couple of wonderful books about that at the moment about Birmingham. Um, I think there's something in that. And, of course, now Birmingham is extraordinarily multicultural. You know, Birmingham, the Indians of Birmingham have given the word, bal- you know, given the world Balti as an Indian dish that yeah, kind of... Yeah. So the, the Balti district of Birmingham is I could spend six months just eating my way around the, the Balti <laughs> restaurants in Birmingham. <laughs> yeah, and when I, look, I remember studying Birmingham at school, at secondary school, and it was just this, you know, it was just known for this coal, and it was a really, really tough place. Yeah, and all cities are. Yeah. Um, and for me, there's so many echoes there. The, the main little river running through Birmingham is the River Ray. In our neighbourhood, it ran through a big park, Cannon Hill Park, but it was channelled, still is. Um, nature to me when I was growing up in Birmingham was, you know, um, the, the park or my back garden. It was very manicured um, and overwhelmed by the city. And as a family, we'd go out um, into the countryside with the weekends for walks, for drives, and um, going up to the Licky Hills, um, looking back into Birmingham and seeing distant the, the big car factories yep. and the Cadbury factory and the whole Quaker history of the Cadburys and how they looked after their people at Bourneville. Um, there's a rich history there, but it's not about the, It's about learning from the history and saying, what are some of the things that made Birmingham so innovative? What's made it so, such a multicultural society today? Um, what do we learn from that and take forward? I, I want This is not an old bloke. I don't want to be an old bloke reminiscing about the past. I want to be um, a person of some years um, reflecting on the past and applying it to the future. Yeah. What a great way to, to end the interview, uh, Rod, with that. And we're only ending it because we're out of time. And you've got to head off to uh, Radio New Zealand now to do that. And I look forward to this interview in 12 months' time, Rod, and we won't have to go over the, the background. We'll all regret <laughs> that. And we will be able to cover more more subjects. And, um, you know, the thing today that, that I've just written down here, that, you know, connecting with nature and, and understanding ecosystems is a lovely surprise to come out of this conversation for me because I've never really... That's never really dropped so much for me as before. That might that might be the thing that 
will bind us together as a human race because at the moment we are just uh, pulling each other apart right now. And that love of nature, because I think most people do love nature, uh, when they under- especially when they understand it. Absolutely. And I want to stress I'm a business journalist, and so my fascination is how do businesses respond to that? Yeah. Um, and um, but that's another and, whole topic And, and, and Rod, that's why the, the wonderful surprise today, talking to a business journalist, right, that we've got to that. Yes. Right? And I go, that's pretty cool. That is very cool. I love the unexpected stuff. So I'm not beating myself up that we haven't stuck to the schedule that I'd put down. Instead, we've meandered here, but that's the thing that's really landed for me. So, Rod, thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope you'll uh, agree to the interview in 12 months' time again and and redo this because uh, you know I love the fact that you've got this experience and this global view uh, and... And I'm really interested to hear about the trip into Birmingham as well because that's, you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, So, Rod, thank you very much for your time uh, until 2021. Let's do this again if you've got time. Well, we will certainly make time. Um, Thank you. It's been a huge treat. And thanks for the chance for a good old chat. Brilliant. Thanks, Rod. You've just been listening to an episode of Stuff That Matters Now brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I hope you enjoyed listening to the fun stuff, the rugged stuff and the complete stuff up that have helped this particular Collective Intelligence member evolve while making the world a better place. Do check out our Stuff That Matters Now podcast series on your favourite podcast provider or visit our website www.collectiveintelligence.co.nz to get links to new episodes. Contact us if you want to learn more about how we can help you evolve yourself and others. Thanks for listening.